started. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Abby Williams, Vice President of the Center for Conflict Analysis and Prevention at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this panel discussion on new strategies for international cooperation. This is a period of transition for the United States. The handover from one president to another is approaching. At such a significant time, we at the Institute thought it would be useful to organize this Passing the Baton conference with three objectives. First, to identify key issues for the new administration in the foreign policy arena. Second, to highlight issues central to the Institute's work. And third, to inform the public debate on these critical challenges. These objectives certainly apply to the subject of this panel discussion. It may be asked, why bother with international cooperation? Why do we need it? I think there is an evident need for international cooperation in attaining US foreign policy goals on a range of important issues from nuclear proliferation to terrorism, climate change, energy security, poverty, and disease. International cooperation is also important for legitimacy and burden sharing. In short, international cooperation is no longer a question of if, but how. And policymakers must necessarily find ways of securing international cooperation in promoting the national interest. It is, it is a challenge that must be met but is a challenge which could be so easily missed. This brings us to strategy. Strategy is essential in achieving international cooperation. It is important to give priority to strategy over tactics, though you need both. How can the new administration pursue cooperation with major powers such as Russia and China and continue to develop strategic partnerships with India, Brazil, and other emerging powers? What will be the relationship between the United States and the United Nations and the role of the UN in the US strategic question, equation? What does international cooperation mean and how can it be pursued in a networked world? To discuss these issues today, we have a distinguished panel with a wide range of military, diplomatic, and academic experience in varied worlds and in different capacities, our three panelists have been active in working to achieve international cooperation on the major issues of our time. Let me introduce them briefly in the order in which they will speak. Dr. Robert Orr is Assistant Secretary General for Strategic Planning and Policy Coordination in the Executive Office of the United Nations Secretary General. From 1996 to 2001, Dr. Orr served in senior posts in the United States government, including deputy to the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations and director of the U.S. UN Washington office, and was instrumental in securing an agreement to have the United States pay its arrears to the United Nations. Professor Anne-Marie Slaughter is dean of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton. She has held a professorship at Harvard Law School and is a former president of the American Society of International Law. Her most recent book is The Idea That Is America, Keeping Faith with Our Values in a Dangerous World. Professor Slaughter has an article in the current issue of foreign affairs entitled America's Edge, Power in the Networked Century. Ambassador Richard Armitage is president of Armitage International, he was Deputy Secretary of State from 2001 to 2005. From 1989 to 1992, he filled key diplomatic positions as Presidential Special Negotiator for the Philippines Military Basis Agreement and Special Mediator for Water in the Middle East. President Bush sent him as a Special Emissary to King Hussein of Jordan during the 1991 Gulf War. A graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, he completed three combat tours in Vietnam. I'm going to ask them each to limit their opening remarks to 10 minutes. Then we will have a question and answer period. 
So, Bob, you have the floor. Thank you, Abby. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today, and uh, I'm honored to kick off this panel, uh, first of all, because the UN never gets to go first in Washington, so uh, <laughs> something really is different in the air here if uh, the UN actually gets to go first. And secondly, because of the, the distinguished uh, fellow panelists on either side, it's a real honor to be here. Um, if we're talking about new strategies for international cooperation, what I want to talk about this afternoon is really a new twist on a very old strategy, and that is using multilateral instruments like the UN to build coalitions, to share burdens, and to uh, join, uh, form uh, joint approaches to the global problems facing uh, the United States. I say a new twist on a very old issue because for many in Washington, I think uh, it's safe to say many of the people in this room are unaware of just how much the UN is doing today and how much is being asked of it. It, it is truly unprecedented what not only the United States is asking the UN to do, but the rest of the countries of the world as well. And from Washington, which can, if you'll pardon my saying it, be very Washington-centric, um, there are, are many things that have happened in the UN that I think have been missed here. So I'd like to flag some of the key issues today and the role the UN is playing so you are aware, but also flag where, there are, where there's room for even more use of multilateral instruments in the, the coming years. I think the trend to using the UN and multilateral instruments is likely to increase, and I think there are various reasons for this. First, in an increasingly globalized world, legitimacy of any kind of operation has become much more important than it was even 10, certainly 20, 30 years ago. And the kind of legitimacy that the universal organization of the UN with um, a wide-ranging mandate provides uh, offers the United States options uh, that in, in, not in all cases, but that in most cases, uh, it produces uh, strikingly better results if it can be done through the UN. Secondly, some of the key 21st century challenges are global goods issues, uh, global public goods issues. These are the issues that affect all and require all for the solution, climate change key global health challenges, uh, non-proliferation disarmament, uh, global uh, terrorism. These are the kinds of issues that need a universal answer. There is only one forum for that. That's the UN, and this is increasingly being reflected in what we're being asked to do. Lastly, and this is something that I think many in Washington have missed, the UN has much more effective operational capacity today than it had five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. In fact, the UN is probably unrecognizable to some people that maybe worked with it a decade ago. And I, I use a decade, maybe say eight years ago. For anyone who, like me, served in the Clinton administration, if you went somewhere else and came back today, you're dealing with a very different operational capacity at the UN than you were eight years ago. Um, under Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, uh, the UN has emphasized three core priorities. First, the gro global goods issues that I just mentioned. Secondly, uh, securing operational uh, goods, humanitarian, peacekeeping, and the like, for the world's most vulnerable people. And this is a, a specialized area that the UN has always ended up with uh, what some might consider the dregs, both in terms of uh, the various crises and the, the problems. But it means we are operational in the places where most people are not. Uh, and lastly, uh, a focus on accountability, both within the UN and among UN member states. Uh, there has to be uh, mutual accountability to solve a lot of these problems, and we do not have the tools currently to have that full accountability. So these have been the three areas of emphasis. Um, I am struck looking at our agenda. I, I uh, run the policy committee, which is effectively the cabinet for the Secretary General. If you look at our agenda for the next three months, and the issues on the agenda for this conference today, guess what? They're the exact same things, with one big difference. Uh, I don't see Africa on the agenda today. Uh, if you come to the UN, Africa is very much on the agenda. 
uh, Sudan, DRC, Zimbabwe, um, uh, Somalia. So that would be the one big distinction I would make between what you're looking at today and what we're looking at. Otherwise, it looks almost the same. A few words on some of these uh, key challenges that, that I've mentioned. The global goods issues that everyone recognizes, uh, like climate change, clearly 2009, uh, the Secretary General has declared this the year of climate change for two reasons. Uh, one, the negotiation is scheduled to conclude at the end of this year. That's a very, very aggressive timeline. Two, the science is telling us that uh, the clock is ticking very loudly. But three, the stars are lining up for a, a global climate deal. And uh, that, I, I would not have said that a year ago, two years ago. I will say it now. The stars are lining up. But the stars start lining up here in Washington. And the, there will be real um, need for Washington to lead on the global uh, climate negotiation. And if Washington leads, the chances of there being a global climate deal are very good. Um, second in the global uh, kind of public goods area is the question of global financial stability. The UN is not the vehicle for achieving global financial stability, but the UN is currently being asked to be really one of the front line, if not the front line organization for dealing with the consequences of the lack of financial stability and the economic downturn. The shock waves are hitting the people around the world that can least afford it, and right now we are bearing the brunt of that. But in the coming year, the United States is going to have to have its own strategy and work with us to make sure that those most vulnerable populations around the world don't continue to bear the brunt or the consequences in security terms uh, as well as in human terms will be uh, quite significant. I would very quickly mention a couple other things. The global food crisis. Uh, no, no talk of it anymore in the newspapers. No talk of it in Washington that I can see. The global food crisis is alive and well. It was not ever a global food price crisis. The prices have gone down. It's a global food security crisis. Planting is way down in many places in 2008. Guess what? Hunger is going to be much greater in 2009 in key places where we cannot afford to have hunger be greater. The food crisis is real, needs attention, needs U.S. attention. The U.S. has been good on these issues. We will need the U.S. to continue to help lead on them but we will need followers. Um, another issue uh, that I think bears underlining is the global health basket. Um, in the same way that years ago uh, the U.S. helped to mobilize global public opinion uh, that HIV AIDS was a security threat and that everyone needed to rally around, create new institutions and deal with this in a new way, so too a whole range of global public health threats. The Secretary General has helped to bring all the key actors together to help set an agenda in this area, and I think we will need uh, really active U.S. Uh, participation in this effort. We have had good cooperation with the Bush administration on this. I think we will need even broader um, uh, cooperation with the Obama administration and the new Congress. Uh, I would note on nonproliferation and disarmament, this is a moment in which there are great expectations for change. If, if I had to put a measuring stick in the international community, I would say one of the key areas that pops off the charts is all around the world, people are hoping Washington is going to turn the page and do some things very differently. Uh, I would strongly advise for anyone who might be dealing with these issues, an early down payment that the U.S. is going to do some things differently in this area will uh, reap large, large benefits to U.S. Um, uh, prestige in the world and ability to leverage that into other areas, whether it is uh, quick ratification of CTBT or in other areas, I think an early investment will pay large rewards. One other area that I'd like to underscore is counterterrorism. No one thinks of counterterrorism in the U.N. in the same word, or very few people. Uh, it's time you start thinking about it. Um, the UN is very different today than it was four or eight years ago on counterterrorism. There is a global counterterrorism strategy agreed to by all member states of the UN that is a robust framework for counterterrorism. The UN can't do everything in counterterrorism, shouldn't be asked to, but there are a whole range of things that the US is currently doing bilaterally that it could do multilaterally and leverage 
uh, gains in the counterterrorism area much more effectively than is currently happening. A quick word on some of our, our old business lines, if you will, peacekeeping. Uh, I think most of you know peacekeeping uh, of the UN handles a lot of the problems in places that the US does not generally do bilaterally. But I don't think the scale is fully appreciated by many. Over 110,000 uh, people currently deployed in UN peacekeeping, second only in terms of people deployed around the world to the United States. While we do not have an army or anything like it, the fact that the UN has that number of people deployed means that you need to think of us in a very different way when we talk about managing global security. Um, one other business line that it works, so we talk about it very little, is humanitarian response. But the demands are going up uh, in key areas. Natural disasters going off the charts, in part related to climate change. Uh, we expect those to continue. Um, the mechanisms we have work. It's a great mechanism for burden sharing, and the U.S. is generally one of our most supportive member states in this area. But again, you need to build coalitions that expand and deepen the support in this area so that the U.S. is not, um, uh, if not alone, if uh, not carrying inordinate burdens in this area. Um, finally, I would wrap up with a word on human rights. Um, the U.S. credibility right now, I think it's safe to say, is at an all-time low on human rights, certainly in the post-war period. Uh, being an American at the UN, you feel it on a daily basis. Um, if the United States is to turn its image around in the international community, the area that you need to start with is probably on human rights. Um, this is an area where uh, is, there are some high rewards if the US is able to, to do some things differently, but not just do things differently for the United States, but to leverage those changes into changes in the international arena. Uh, you need an international human rights policy, not just a national human rights policy. You do need both, and I think, again, this is a high value area for you to, to consider. Uh, in particular, the notion of operationalizing the responsibility to protect. I know that Secretary Albright and Secretary Cohen this morning launched the report on preventing genocide. This is an area where the overlap between, I think, the U.S. agenda and the U.N. agenda is quite large and should be uh, leveraged. Uh, I'm sorry, finally a word on just the U.S.-U.N. relationship. This is always kind of a sine curve. It goes up and down and up and down. Uh, right now, uh, we're coming out of a, a real trough period and we're moving up the sine wave. Um, but nothing is inevitable. The importance of continuing to move up the sine wave of the US-UN relationship is that you use the UN intelligently. Do not turn to the UN for everything. Don't come to the UN for things that you know we are going to fail at. Uh, and I think this is a conversation. The US can't have a policy made here and then bring it to the UN and say, we want you to do this. There has to be an iterative process of dialogue with key member states and with the UN Secretary General to determine what the appropriate agenda at the UN is. And it's very important that very basic uh, approach has not been taken on key issues in the past. This time around, we have to get that right. Uh, final word on the, the US-UN relationship is about uh, thinking big in multilateralism right now. Not necessarily, again, that everything has a multilateral solution, but that we are at a moment where the UN was created uh, 60 years ago and was itself a combination of combining power and principle. And we are at a moment where we need to recombine power and principle. And we need to do it not just in the security sphere, uh, five members of the Security Council or 15 cannot do all the security lifting. There has to be certain tasks that they do take unique responsibility for, but that that circle is broadened on a range of other issues. In the economic sphere, the G8 or the G20 cannot do it all. They should do their part on key things, but then there has to be a strategy for how you broaden that out to make sure everyone is a participant in economic recovery and managing the consequences of these dire economic times. And lastly, in the climate area, the same analog. 
16 emitters cannot lock themselves in a room and come up with a solution for climate change. While they do need to do that, those who emit the most do need to come to some understandings among each other, there has to be a way to uh, bring that then into a room of 195. This is something that I think uh, is, is for the making. The combination of power and principle uh, that was done 60 years ago does not serve for today. And you do need to think big about how to recombine power and principle in these very challenging times. And the UN stands ready to work with the US on this and all the challenges I've mentioned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Thank you very much, Bob, and thank you for the discipline in uh, um, observing the time limit, which, of course, undercuts the prevailing view in some quarters that uh, UN officials <laughs> cannot be disciplined when given the floor. Uh, let me turn, give the floor now to Anne-Marie Slaughter. Well, it's no light. Right before Christmas, uh, Prospect Magazine, the British Prospect Magazine, not the American Prospect, uh, asked a number of thinkers to identify what was the most underrated event of 2008 and what was the most overrated event of 2008. I'm not going to tell you what I said was the most overrated event. You can go to the website and read that and the thoughts of many others. But I said I thought the most underrated event was the disappearance or the replacement of the G8 by the G20. Because in fact, what happened in November when the G20 met in Washington, the leaders of 20 nations representing the developing world, emerging markets, rising powers, as well as established powers, was, in my view, de facto the expansion of the G8. Doesn't mean the G8 can't still meet, but it will effectively meet uh, as a subgroup of the G20. That's very important if we're going to talk about international institutions, because I could probably fill this room with articles and reports produced by people like me and uh, Bob and <laughs> many people in this room arguing for what is the exact way to expand the G8 and what is the perfect number. Uh, should it be the G13, uh, where you add China uh, and India uh, and uh, Brazil and South Africa uh, and one other uh, country? Should it be the G16, where you add those countries uh, and a couple of more? Uh, should it be variable geometry, so it can be sometimes the G15 and sometimes the G17? We could go on for another decade uh, imagining what is the perfect uh, number, but de facto what happened was that the G20 of finance ministers, which was created after the East Asian financial crisis in the late 1990s and hence is heavily weighted toward Asian countries. It includes South Korea, Indonesia, uh, India of course, but also Australia uh, in addition uh, to Latin American countries uh, and African countries. Th that group, the G20 of finance ministers, met as the G20 of leaders and is supposed to meet again in April. Once that group has, is seized of the global financial crisis, there's no going back. You can't expel some of those members. You can't now call for a meeting of the G13. You can have, again, smaller meetings within the G20, but the G20 de facto became the informal grouping that it was charged with dealing with a global financial crisis and will meet again in April with President Obama there and will become the sm smaller group uh, for the major uh, decisions and often the group that will come up with proposals that will then be taken to the more formal international institutions. Uh, so I want to start by saying we have now uh, actually been forced into a much more representative grouping of countries uh, in the G20. Uh, it includes India and Brazil and China and Indonesia, uh, South Africa, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, uh, as I said, also Australia, South Korea, uh, and a couple of other countries. 
that's a start, and it's an important start. But in, if we're going to go forward on informal networks for international cooperation, and I'm going to come to the formal institutions in a minute, the focus has been on getting that G20 of finance ministers to meet at the leaders' level, just like the G8 does. And now we have the G8 of leaders. But I would say what we actually need are the G20 of food ministers, the G20 of environmental ministers, the G20 of energy ministers, uh, the G20 of counterterrorism top officials. In other words, we need the, that group of nations, and it can certainly include some others, depending on what the issue is. If it's the environment, it will include some other nations. If it's energy, it will include some other nations. But we need that grouping to expand to many, many more substantive areas where we do not have the ability for top officials to get together informally to, to throw to try out ideas, to develop proposals, uh, to negotiate, and then to see uh, where those can go on a regional or a global level. In addition, we're going to need that group uh, to be able to connect to other officials uh, in their own countries, so lower level working groups, and also connect to the many networks of non-governmental organizations and of private sector institutions that already exist. Abi uh, started by talking about the networked world. We're in the networked world. We are networked uh, in every way we can imagine and becoming more so by the day. Uh, every time I turn around, some other major august institution has a MySpace uh, page or a YouTube site uh, and is using uh, MySpace uh, for, for actually social networking but also doing business. That's what we take for granted as a matter of our daily lives, but our politics and our ability to cooperate and to solve problems has to harness the power of those networks through groups like the G20 and all the networks that can follow from them, but also the connecting of those public networks to all the nonprofit and private networks. What I'm describing looks a lot like the way the EU runs its business, although the EU is much more formal than anything I'm talking about. But it is a way for many countries to come together to work with official actors and unofficial actors to actually get things done on a pragmatic basis without all the formal negotiations and the endless, endless uh, time that it takes to get formal treaties. So the first thing I'd say about cooperation uh, going forward is that we've already had the change that many of us have spent a great deal of time calling for in the informal sector, and we now need to build on that, uh, tackling all the problems that Bob talked about. That doesn't mean that there's not a key role for the formal institutions. And we led off with the UN, and uh, that is, I think, significant. The formal institutions, the UN, the World Bank, the IMF, the World, the, the World Trade Organization, the World Food Organization, uh, the many other uh, regional organizations and functional organizations uh, are often far more important uh, than many, particularly in this town, realize. And as Bob said, often increasingly have operational capacity. They don't just talk and pass resolutions. They actually do things. But many of them need fairly dramatic reform. And I'm not going to go through each one, but I will say something about uh, the UN and specifically the Security Council. I said the G20 has replaced the G8, that the councils of power, the table of decision, is no longer limited to Japan, North America, and Western Europe. It is now extended to countries on every continent, emerging countries, uh, as well as uh, much more established countries. But that's the informal group. That's the G dash something. The Security Council still looks like the configuration of power in 1945 with a, a, a sort of a little boost for France, because France actually wasn't in such great shape in 1945. But uh, as, a, as a members of the Security Council, that power configuration is completely outdated. Now, in this town or any town, talk about Security Council reform, and I'll have you asleep in two minutes. Uh, and many people uh, will just roll their eyes and say it can never happen. We shouldn't bother. 
My response to that is that if it doesn't happen, the UN will become less and less relevant for major decisions. Its, its specific uh, agencies will remain very important, the different departments, but the ability of the UN to legitimize global decisions, which is often when it is most important, that global counterterrorism strategy that Bob was talking about has been hugely helpful to US counterterrorism efforts because we can say these measures were passed by the UN, they are globally mandated. Uh, similarly, of course, when we use force, having a UN mandate is extremely helpful. But unless the Security Council represents the world that we are now in, it is increasingly seen as illegitimate, not just in the United States, which is also true, but in many parts of the world. And what to do about it? Well, I actually think there, there, are, there are many plans for Security Council reform. There are two perfectly good ones that were come up, that were, were developed by the high-level panel on threats, challenges, and change by Kofi Annan. They, they put forward their proposals. One was for to add uh, Japan and Germany uh, and Brazil and India and uh, two African nations as permanent mem members, not with a veto. The other was something called Plan B that effectively would have achieved the same result where you would have had those six countries sitting on the Security Council all the time, but in a, a, rotating, uh, or a rotating structure. Either one of those could have been passed in 1996 if the United States had been willing to put its own capital behind getting it passed. That doesn't mean the U.S. should come up with a plan, should drive Security Council reform, but I think if the United States were to say, we understand that this organization has to be reformed and we will support whatever the other 194 countries can agree to or some large majority, whether that's adding those six countries as permanent members, they can get the votes, and Germany uh, and Japan and Brazil and India think they can get the votes. I'd say let them try. If they can get the votes, then do it that way. If they can't, then do the rotating structure. But we ought to make clear that we understand that these institutions can't do what we want them to do and what we need them to do unless they are more representative. You can't ask people to share burdens if they're not part of the decision-making structure. Uh, and there, we've been pushing this and pushing this. We've come to the point where we're actually endangering uh, our ability to use these institutions as effectively as we need to. So that's the informal institutions uh, and the formal institutions. Let me conclude uh, with uh, strategies of cooperation, since that was one of our tasks. Uh, this summer, uh, the Center for a New American Security, another very distinguished organization in addition to the uh, U.S. Institute of Peace, uh, issued a report called Strategic Leadership uh, that was authored uh, by a number of people who are in the current administration, uh, the, Jim Steinberg, the uh, soon-to-be Deputy Secretary of State, uh, Susan Rice wrote the foreword, uh, Kurt Campbell, Lael Brainerd, uh, Evo Dalder, and yours truly, uh, and a couple of others, uh, wrote a report called Strategic Leadership. And the concept of strategic leadership says the United States has to lead, and indeed we just heard a number of places where unless the U.S. leads, nonproliferation, climate change, nothing will happen. So we must lead in some areas. There is no choice, and it is time uh, that we, and indeed over time, uh, that we return to leadership uh, on some of those issues. In other areas, we've continued to, to lead. But there, we no longer can think of reclaiming the mantle of global leadership as if it were a, a unitary garment, that we can pick it up and take over uh, on the full range of issues uh, that Bob and others have discussed over the course of the day. Instead, we need partners. We need to decide what are the issues where we have to lead and where we should put all our energies into developing a leadership strategy. And what are the areas where, in fact, we should let, leave it to others? Don't worry. Um, <laughs> There are uh, issues, for instance, uh, like develop the, working with China to develop green technology, the, the, the preparatory work uh, on climate change. The U.S. doesn't have to lead there. Japan is anxious uh, to lead there. 
uh, in areas in Latin America, looking at a number of the major problems which we rarely focus on in Latin America, we can turn to both Brazil and Mexico, both of which are anxious to take a much bigger role uh, in the region. Even in the Middle East, where we do need to lead in many ways, there are other actors who are anxious to play a role and are playing a bigger role. Turkey ur urging Israel to open negotiations with Syria is just one example. Strategic leadership means looking for partners. Uh, it means occasionally suggesting that others take the lead. That is a way of inviting much more cooperation than leading, than getting out, out front ourselves and expecting others to follow. Either we will get others to take up some of that leadership, or in many cases, when we ask others to lead, they actually realize that there's a benefit uh, to having us uh, certainly as a full partner, that they don't actually want us to pull back. They want us to be part of that leadership structure. In either case, leading strategically, thinking about where we can share burdens, where we can ask others to take the lead is a better way to invite cooperation uh, and achieve it than getting out front and expecting others to follow. Thanks. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Uh, Richard? Uh, thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, I thank you and Dick Solomon for uh, taking pity on an out-of-work Republican and bringing me in from the cold. <laughs> Everybody's got to be somewhere, I guess, so I appreciate the invitation. Batting cleanup uh, on a panel like this, you find that you're in the position of saying that everything that can be said has been said, just not by me. So uh, I'll try to be as unrepetitive as possible. You know, the, uh, the election of uh, Senator Obama uh, is something that allows us to really uh, change the equation. After 9-11, as I've said in other four, we've been busy uh, exporting something which is quite foreign to us. In our fear and our anger, we were facing, a, or facing the world with a very angry and unwelcoming face. And I think Mr. Obama's election allows us to really change that and change it rather dramatically and quickly. And in order to do that, and in order to get some wind in the sails of internationalism, I would suggest that he does that he would do two things immediately upon assuming the presidency. The first is call for the Senate to immediately ratify the Law of the Sea Treaty. It's been hanging around since 1982. It's about time. And I would uh, not dilly-dally any longer in the closing of Gitmo. The President of the United States has said for two years he wants to close it, so close it. And I think those two issues taken off the table right in the beginning will put some wind, as I say, in the sails of internationalism and show that we have a different regard for the international community. There's another item we can engage in, it seems to me, to help us really in this sort of uh, proving to the world that we want to be part of an international equation and in many point, parts we'll be the leader of that international equation. And that is to rethink our public diplomacy. It seems that for successive administrations, public diplomacy has been defined as saying something louder uh, being a little more <laughs> shrill. And let me assure you, of the 193 countries or whatever in the United Nations, there's not a country around that doesn't know exactly what we think on every issue. The question they have is whether we know what they think. So it would seem to me that if Mr. Obama wanted and Mrs. Clinton wanted to be extraordinarily effective right off the bat, they'd send out their brand new diplomatic team with no talking points and tell them to do what's very difficult for Americans to shut up and listen. <laughs> First of all, after countries got over their shock and awe <laughs> at this development, <laughs> I think they might be able to actually uh, assure themselves that this is a, a, new, a new day. I'm not suggesting that we have to agree, by the way, with our interlocutors. I'm just saying we have to listen to them and they have to know we heard them. If we don't have the courage of our own convictions and, and enough knowledge ourselves to be able to react after that in a proper way and show why we think we might have a better way or if they've got a better way to accede to their wishes, then shame on us. Uh, a couple of comments about the United Nations. I wouldn't, as you, Anne-Marie, I don't want to put people to sleep and talk about Security Council reform, but I do have a suggestion that the Security Council should think about, and that is, Although it has been 60 years since the UN Charter was written, we might want to think about reading the Charter again and rethinking the role of the Secretary General. This is taking nothing away from Kofi Annan 
or Ban Ki-moon, who follow the tradition of, of uh, Dag Hammarskjöld and not uh, Kurt Waldheim. But the fact of the matter is, the framers or the drafters of the charter envision the Secretary General to be the chief administrative officer of the body. That is a quote, that's not my chief language. And that the Security Council in Chapter 5 of the Charter was to be the executive decision maker of the body to whom member states would make forces available for Chapter 7, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not suggesting we go all the way back to administrative officer, but I think if you want a Security Council that works, then we're going to have to have a slight bit more uh, uh, sort of uh, administrative uh, activities by the Secretary General. God knows there's plenty of work in that area to be done. It's slightly more decision-making, weighty decision-making by the 15 both elected and uh, appointed uh, permanent members of the Security Council. I think President Obama has done a great favor to both uh, the UN and to ourselves by uh, nominating Dr. Rice to be our UN ambassador. I think it's a good thing. She's seen as close to him, and I think that there's a message in that. It's quite a different message from the message we sent when we had John Bolton go to the UN. The irony here is John is probably, by his, his training, by his intellect, and by his, the jobs he's had in government, I don't think there has ever been someone who is more ideally suited by background to the job of ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, now, his affection for the body was somewhat under, uh, uh, under control. Uh, <laughs> but I think quite the opposite message has been sent by Dr. Rice, and I think this is a very, very good and necessary thing. We've talked a lot about the UN and not much about other uh, international organizations, such as NATO, which is not in descendancy. The UN may be, at least in the short term. I would say it's in some descendancy. The Georgia situation was not NATO's finest day. Uh, if Afghanistan doesn't come out well, the usefulness of NATO as an international organization will come under severe question and severe pressure. And well, it should. I was going to talk also about the new grouping of the G20 at, uh, and their meeting in London in April. You're right, it, it, in a way, it, it has the new, it's the new G8. Uh, Kevin Rudd, the Prime Minister of Australia, writes about it today in the Financial Times, and he, he says that, uh, how necessary it is for the great nations, the G20, to coordinate their financial activities, et cetera. But the word he used is coordinate and cooperate. Because I think, although it's not stated in the article, no matter how useful the G20 can be, and it can be very useful, uh, it's not going to mean that a great economy like the United States or any of the other great economies subordinate their decisions on their economy to any international grouping. They're not going to do it, particularly into these times where protection is now pushing at the doors of many countries, including, including our own. So I like your term, Henry, about variable geometry. It's what I call uh, functional coalitions. In, uh, after the terrible event of the tsunami in 2004-2005, we did just that. It did take the United States to coalesce it, asked the Indians, the Japanese, and the Australians to get together with us. We coordinated our capital by telephone, and as people in Indonesia and Thailand and Sri Lanka well, and Malaysia to some extent will tell you, it was an extraordinarily useful functional co coalition or a veritable geometry coalition. We've got other opportunities today. Uh, it's not a secret that the United Nations, excuse me, the United States credibility <laughs> is suffering a little bit in the NPT arena because of the manner in which we engaged with India. I'm not apologizing for that engagement. It was a long-term policy goal of the United States. I think in the long term it will be a very good thing, and I have no questions about India's ability to protect nuclear technology. She's never had a problem uh, at all. But the manner in which we went about it, I think, has caused our credibility in that area to suffer. We have now a, uh, a two-year member of the Security Council of Japan whose credibility in the NPT it's enormous. So if you could align the credibility of Japan and let them take the lead with the capability Absolutely. for monitoring, et cetera, the NPT, uh, and gather others with us, this would be a fantastic functional uh, coalition. And it's one that's sorely needed if the intelligence communities are correct in what they have to say. I completely endorse what you say about uh, Japan, US, the two largest techno technological giants cooperating together to better the situation uh, on environment, climate, in uh, China particularly. But you might also extend that to energy, whether it's the use of nanotechnology, et cetera. Uh, you can have uh, the most wired country in the world, Korea, join us in this endeavor. Uh, it just takes a little imagination, it seems to me, and a little spark. Uh, 
I'm not sure, and I don't wish this, because I, I would put myself down on the side of internationalists, but 25 or 20 years from now, I'm not sure how the today's international organizations will look. I don't think they're going to look great, but I think there'll be a lot of functional coalitions which mm -hmm. look a lot better. Now, there was a, a, the comment was made, I think, Dr. Williams, you made in the beginning about burden sharing. Let's be clear about one thing. Burden sharing is also power sharing. Now, we can talk about this, and people can nod their heads, but I can assure you, at least for the U.S. Congress, who always yells about burden sharing, <laughs> when you come back and then say, yes, but there's a little power sharing, they don't like that part. They don't want to hear that part. But I think when we talk about sharing a burden, we need to also realize that there is of necessity a certain amount of power sharing. We've got to get used to that. So uh, asked about large powers or how to get along with the Indias and the Chinas and the Russia, a resurgent Russia and uh, Brazil, I don't think it's all that difficult. If you look at each of those countries, there are issues which we have and they have. We share with China the, the climate and the, the emissions problem, we share terrorism, uh, things of that nature. The financial meltdown affects them as us. With Russia, we've got exactly the same problems with drugs, with HIV, AIDS, uh, with terrorism. So there are s sufficient centers of gravity with every country which we can engage them, that we have to do it in a way that is both respectful and not overbearing. And I'm not, again, suggesting in any way that we have to exceed or agree with them on every issue, but it's the manner in which you engage them. Russia's problem with the United States in the last couple of years has been much more in the manner in which we engage them than actually surprised at our positions on different issues. They didn't have any surprises, but they were not happy because so they felt they couldn't even get a hearing. So I think the, the engagement of the major powers and the upcoming developing powers is not so hard. You just have to be somewhat respectful, sort of the same way you'd like me to deal with you, and I'd certainly want you to deal with me. Well, finally, I'm one of those who, I guess with Mrs. Albright and others, puts myself in the camp of believing that most of the people and most of the nations in the world want the United States uh, to be an indispensable nation. It's not an arrogant comment. I think it's a true comment. Most of them do. That's why they constantly, and they realize our power, but they also realize our national characteristics. And when this nation has our national characteristics and our words and our actions in line, then I think most of the nations in the world want us to be the indispensable nation. It's when our characteristics and our words and our actions are out of line, that we fall in the degree of affection which other nations have for us. So I guess at the end of the day, what I'm saying is for the United States, where principle is involved, we need to be deaf to expediency. We've got to make sure that the image others in the world have of us, to use what's become almost a hackneyed phrase, should be the shining city on the hill and not Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Richard, and thank you to our three panelists for these excellent presentations. I'm mindful that we have uh, uh, 10 minutes um, uh, before the end of the allotted, the allotted time for this session. So what I think I will do is just take a set of three or four questions, if we have four, and then turn it over to the panelists to react before wrapping up. And if you can just uh, give us your name and affiliation, that will be helpful. Hi, Sebastian Franz, an American University. Uh, first of all, thank you for speaking to us today. Uh, we heard Dr. Orr say some of the new initiatives with uh, Ban Ki-moon being the new Secretary General. And perhaps this is what part of what one of the steps you mentioned. But the, the one thing I've always uh, noticed is the lack of efficiency with, with big governing organizations, especially such as the UN, and with voices such as those of Dean Slaughter calling for an expansion of perhaps uh, even the Security Council to be more representative of the, of the world, how do you find consensus? Would that have to include abolishing the veto right? Uh, would that have to include having it be a vote and having to reach 51% and then saying, you know, but 
with, with issues such as state sovereignty having so much uh, importance these days with, with certain countries, how do you come to a decision? Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Mindy Reiser with the United Nations Association here in the National Capital Area. The Middle East challenge has been around a very long time. Uh, we've had special rapporteurs, we've had all kinds of missions, delegations, caucuses. I'd like to hear some creative ideas that haven't been tried. It's on the front pages, it continues to be, and the world is getting caught in this uh, miasma once again. Okay. Just two more brief questions, one in, in front. Wolfgang Dansbeck Gruber, Princeton University, indeed serving with Anne Marie Slaughter. Uh, I wanted to add um, a question in terms of visionary elements. It's wonderful to talk about uh, the development towards the G20 and flexible geometry. It's also wonderful to talk about the UN Security Council reform. Where does in all this fit in the increasing relevance of non-state actors? Beverly Lindsay, Penn State. My question is for any of the panelists, and that is, you've made a number of very insightful suggestions and recommendations, but how will one help the American public to understand this? Because if we look back historically, Woodrow Wilson, we can name other presidents since then, had difficulty having their initiatives for change accepted by the American public, and then the Senate and other bodies voted against them. Okay. Thank you very much for those questions. I'll ask our panelists to now uh, respond, beginning with Anne-Marie Slaughter. Let me see if I can do this in uh, one sentence each per uh, mm -hmm. question. So on the, the aren't we going to make the UN Security Council uh, even more dysfunctional, even more blocked? You know, the G20 is bigger than the G8. It's, uh, it, it's hard to even get agreement in the G8. Sometimes bigger groups actually create possibilities for linkages and also possibilities for shaming holdouts uh, so that the, the game theory uh, analyses, and I'm certainly not going to try to do them here, of an expanded security council indicate that there are actually possibilities to help it achieve uh, consensus, or at the very least it won't be worse. Uh, on the uh, on the Middle East, there, my my colleagues will both have answers. I would say two things uh, that I would suggest. Uh, one is that President-elect Obama and Secretary-designate Clinton both are clearly thinking about the Middle East as one region from Israel to India. It is not the Israeli-Palestinian problem, the Iraqi problem, the Iranian problem, the Pakistan, Afghanistan, India problem. It is an entire region, and we have to think about it is in terms of linked problems. Second point is the Middle East is the least institutionalized region in the world. There are, there's the Gulf Cooperation Council and the Arab League and not much else, and it is time that the EU, the US, uh, and the, all the countries neighboring the Middle East work to try to get more institutions that can help in crisis prevention, and also things like water, food, uh, some of the, the less hot-button issues. That was more than one sentence. Non-state actors, uh, non-state actors are a critical part of the networks that uh, I was talking about. One of the great advantages to multiple, varia multiple geometry groups or networks is precisely that they can engage non-state actors flexibly uh, in important ways, but non-state actors also increasingly have a role even at places like the UN. Um, and the way you get America to pay attention, well, electing a, or naming a U.S. senator, uh, a U.S. senator who has just run for president as secretary of state, is one very good way to raise the profile of the importance of diplomacy. She understands she's got an internal audience just as much as an external one. Thank you. Uh, Bob? Well, Anne-Marie tried to do one sentence on all four. I'm going to maybe do two sentences on two. Um, on the, the first question about uh, the efficiency, I know the question was about efficiency of the UN Security Council, and Anne-Marie, I think, uh, answered that well. I want to talk about a minute the efficiency of uh, the UN itself. 
Uh, we've seen study after study, including by the U.S. government as recently as a GAO study uh, less than two years ago, said U.N. peacekeeping is eight times more efficient than U.S. Eight times. That's a U.S. study, well documented. Now, they're not the same instruments. You want to use the U.S. military for something very different than you want to use U.N. peacekeeping for. But when you think about efficiency, think not just about deficiency of decision making. The U.N. is not always the most efficient. It is the most legitimate. Um, uh, that may sound hackneyed, but in the eyes of the world, if the UN Security Council has acted, it is different. But in operational terms, the UN also has a comparative advantage and efficiency in key areas, in particular humanitarian assistance and peacekeeping, and I think that's something that's underappreciated. Um, on the uh, Wolfgang's question on the G20, and, and where do non-state actors fit in this world we're talking about? In every one of the global issues that I mentioned, starting with climate change and on down the list, health, et cetera, non-state actors are truly the key actors in the equation. While it's governments sitting down to make these deals, making these deals, even if they are agreed real, is going to require mostly non-state actors. If we take the model, just one little piece of the health equation, look what is happening on malaria a very uh, a UN-centric drive to coordinate all the different actors on malaria has created a public-private partnership dynamic that has us truly on track to get full coverage of malaria by 2010 and bringing deaths by malaria to near zero by 2015. One of the biggest killers in the world today. This is phenomenal. We need to replicate that kind of mobilization of non-state actors with state institutions, with intergovernmental organizations. Um, we can't do the malaria model on everything, but we can do it on a lot of things. Uh, and yeah, there are a number of issues. Uh, I'm sorry, one, one quick word on the American public um, uh, point. Uh, again, I am never the advocate that the UN is the answer for everything, but one thing we have seen, the American public does respond to things when they go through the UN. The American public, it's not just the rest of the world sees it as more legitimate, the American public does. The ideals-based side of American thinking in vis-a-vis -vis foreign policy really resonates well with the institutions of the UN, the ideals-based side of the UN. We may not be perfect, we may have lots of problems, but year in, year out, when things go through the UN, the American public is more likely to sustain it. We've seen that on security issues. We've seen that on human rights issues. We've seen it on development issues on down the list. So part of the strategy is tapping into American idealism and sustaining that through what will be some very difficult times. Uh, we have to deliver the goods, and so we have to focus on operationalization, but we need to, to tap into that deep reservoir of American idealism and then uh, um, link that to outcomes. Thank you. Richard Armitage. Well, first on the Middle East, I guess I'd say, first of all, if I had any good ideas, I've already used them as <laughs> Deputy Secretary of State, and I clearly didn't have any very good ideas. We're still in, in a mess. I, I think, though, I would say that probably uh, three things have to be done. One has been alluded to by Dr. Slaughter, and that is that uh, the whole Middle East is not only lacking in sort of international institutions, each country is lacking in any institutions that could uh, ever support democracy. And I'm talking about everything from transparency to uh, rule of law uh, to uh, institutions which can deliver goods and services, all of which are absolutely necessary if you're going to have anything that approaches uh, a democracy. You have to have that first. Otherwise, a democracy will very soon start to look like Venezuela. Um, second, uh, Part of this is to do something which is unpleasant for American administrations, and that's to stop new settlement activity by Israel. Uh, we can't have the specter of a Secretary of State continually going there saying settlements must stop, they're a hindrance to peace, and have our Israeli allies turn around and then build more settlements while she's there. So it, it takes away from our credibility uh, in, a, in a very serious way, and it's very well known by the Arabs. By the same token, uh, it's quite clear that, to a very large extent, Hamas is getting what they deserve. Uh, the fact that they fire rockets and have for three years now, uh, notwithstanding the quote ceasefire, uh, and disrupt life in certainly southern Israel, it's not acceptable. But finally, 
in the Middle East, we're going to have to engage Iran. Note I say engage or talk to, not negotiate with. Not necessarily. We don't even know if we have enough to negotiate with, but we need to engage them. They are the new factor in the Middle East, and you have the specter of a non-Arab trying to become the dominant power in the Middle East. And this is not generally recognized. It is in some of the states in the Middle East more than others. But this is the dynamic that's going on. I think we have to recognize that. On the question of uh, the American public, I must admit to being quite surprised at something that happened recently. Dr. Joe Nye and I uh, co-chaired a something called a Smart Power Commission. And in the development of our Smart Power recommendations, which are just, we want to have a full tool kit, not just the military tools in our kit. Everything from public demo, demo, uh, diplomacy to uh, health uh, care, et cetera, et cetera. You, you can imagine what it is. It's using soft and hard power together. But in the development of this, we sent uh, groups out to uh, 300 or so different organizations as diverse as Liberty University, uh, Stanford, everywhere. And we went to World Affairs Councils, went to town councils, high schools, everywhere, and had just open discussions. And much to my surprise, overwhelmingly, the American public was very aware that globalization, they may hate it, but that globalization was a phenomenon that in the long run was here to stay. And second of all, that we cannot any longer expect our two great oceans to protect us from everything. We can't wall ourselves up, nor can we just hide behind the, the limits of American juris, uh, jurisprudence. We are involved in the world. And it was overwhelming that this was accepted by the American public. So it leads me to the conclusion that if the president and his chief lieutenants are focused, put a point on their arrow in terms of public diplomacy, Take advantage of international institutions where possible. Don't ask a question, the answer to which you don't already know is what I'm suggesting, which I think is what you were suggesting to the UN. Uh, we can have a good support from the American public. If, on the other hand, we ignore using this bully pulpit because of the depth of our own financial uh, problems right now and economic problems, and then we'll have wasted an opportunity. Okay. Well, thank you. No, no. Thank you very much. We've had uh, three fascinating presentations uh, from our panelists. Um, I think Bob um, was right to remind us at the start of three unique assets which the United Nations has. The first is its legitimacy, which is a unique moral and legal legitimacy. That it's a global forum which we can, be, we can use to deal with global challenges. And I think third, that the UN has improved operational capacities, and those capacities are particularly useful in peace and security, in peacekeeping operations, uh, in humanitarian assistance. And Anne-Marie Slaughter also underlined three, I think, important points. The first, the need for top officials, ministers of the G20, to meet in various fields to tackle a range of global problems. And second, the need to harness the, the power of various networks in a networked world to tackle problems without the impediments inherent in formal institutions and negotiations. And her third point linked to the point Bob made about legitimacy, that if we're going to see a continuation of the UN's key asset, its legitimacy, there is a need to reform the Security Council to reflect the realities of power of the 21st century and not the realities of power of 1945. And Richard Armitage underlined three important points, the need for the new administration to take key actions to signal a difference and a, and a different tone, a different approach, the ratification of the Law of the Sea Treaty, closing of Guantanamo. Second also, the importance of public diplomacy Edward L. Morrow, who knew a lot about public diplomacy, once observed that public diplomacy has to be at the takeoff if, it has, if it's to be at the crash landing. And I think that would be something for the new administration uh, to keep in mind. And the third point, to rethink the role of the, of the UN Secretary General. Uh, clearly, as uh, having served in the UN Secretary General's office together with Bob, um, there is a clear need for the Secretary General to run the House and to uh, be an administrative officer. 
But any Secretary General now, of course, can't, affect, can't escape doing two more things, having a political function and also using the bully pulpit uh, when necessary. Uh, just in closing, let me just say that um, at the very outset, we had the import that the UN reflects the combination of power and principle in its uh, structure and in the way it was founded. And I think the best kind of American foreign policy and leadership has always been a combination of power and principle, and power being in the service of principle rather than the other way around. And one would hope that with the new administration, we will see that, and also the combination of vision and pragmatism, which is what elevates politics into statecraft, apt for the moment, and worthy of the ages. Thank you very much. Thank you.